And now a little about our presenter. Alexis Nicole Nelson is a forager who has fostered a huge following by sharing her hilarious and educational content, helping her followers learn how to identify and prepare the edible plants she finds growing around her neighborhood in Ohio and on her travels. Welcome, Alexis. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be with you all today. We are going to talk about some unexpected spring foraging as opposed to expected spring foraging, <laughs> which I did try very hard to not go for a lot of the basics that I know all of your sweet, smart brains already know are edible. You know, your dandelions, your violets, things that have very much made their way into the zeitgeist. Instead, we're gonna be talking about some like unsung heroes, also maybe some unsung villains. We're gonna have a good time today. <laughs> so without further ado, let's get started. Unexpected spring foraging. I'm very sorry. I have like very much a dad sense of humor. So for the rest of my life, I will be doing the math for what grade I would be in if grade school continued past 12th grade. I am 29, I would be a 23rd grader this year. <laughs> and it's April 23rd. <laughs> so first things first, who is this girl who's going to be teaching me to put things into my mouth? What a good question. <laughs> my name is Alexis. I am an outdoor educator. Um, I am a wild food forager. My mom told me I need to get better about talking about my accolades and I absolutely refuse to do that because it feels weird. Um, but for some reason, my screaming about the plants that I am passionate about has garnered me a little bit of an audience. Life is wild. <laughs> I have been learning about edible wild plants since I was five years old. My mom was my first teacher and I have found literally hundreds of teachers since my mom first taught me how to ID field garlic at age five. I very much consider myself both a student and a teacher because there are always new things to be learning. I literally learned a new edible plant yesterday. So for anyone who's like, how am I ever gonna get to that point? There's no end point. The point does not exist. The limit does not exist. Mean Girls, math, we're continuing past this slide now. <laughs> so before we talk about food things, we're gonna talk about safety things, everyone's favorite. Jokingly with some of my friends, I will say hashtag safety last, but that's not the way it should be. It should always be hashtag safety first. So just a couple of notes that I want all of you to keep in mind. So you are as happy, as healthy, and as safe as you can be while you are venturing out into the world of foraging. First, let's, I put a lot of evers in this. Let's all agree to never, ever, 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 ever eat something without being 100% sure of what it is. I literally will never put something in my mouth unless I can like give you three different points of ID and can say without any hesitation that I know exactly what this plant is. And I feel like everyone should go by the same MO, in my humble opinion. That's the best way to never eat something that'll upset your stomach. Though I will say, and I forgot to put this in, when you are trying a new food, try just a little bit at a time. The worst thing in the world is figuring out that you have an allergy to something that you just made an entire dish out of. Always good to take a couple nibbles, make sure that you're with other people when you do, just to make sure, just to make sure. Additionally, I want you all to be super mindful of where you are gathering. If you see someone with a super manicured lawn or if you are seeing plants on the edges of golf courses, which I hate, one day I will give an entire speech on why golf courses are my mortal enemy. Don't harvest there because the way that you get those manicured lawns, the way that you get that nice, even carpet of grass um, is not with like physical diligence, it's with chemicals. 
And a lot of those are chemicals that you do not want to be putting into your body. Haha, -ha, shout out to other people hating on golf courses. If you golf, no hate, no shade to you, but I wish golf courses were moss. Um, but even then, monocultures are bad. <laughs> so maybe a lot of different kinds of mosses. Mm, mm, mm. Monocultures stink. That is another talk that we can have on another day. I also wish golf courses were food forests. Thank you. So also a lot of people, I get this question made, this is the second I get the question that I get second most after if I've ever eaten anything dangerous before. And it's how do I avoid things that dogs, cats, wolves, chipmunks, gophers, woodchucks, deer have peed on? And people don't like the answer, uh, which is that it's impossible to know for sure that nothing has freshly peed on what you are gathering, regardless of where you are on this planet. Uh, it's also impossible to know that someone didn't freshly pee on the kale at your grocery store. This is why we wash everything that we bring home, every single thing. You can wash it in either warm, salty water, or if it's something that you don't want to accidentally get salty, even a little bit, wash it in a mix of vinegar. Any type of vinegar is fine. And water. Honestly, the older I get, the less issues I have with what I call the dog pee lanes on either side of the sidewalk, mostly because I also know that urea is a major component in a lot of commercial fertilizers. So if I wasn't screaming about the spinach my parents raised me on, I probably shouldn't be screaming about the dandelions that may have gotten peed on five days ago. And that's all I'm gonna say on that. <laughs> pee is free nitrogen, thank you cat. And that's where plants wanna be, where the free nitrogen is. And if you're not lucky enough to be growing near a member of the Fabaceae family, you gotta get it where you can. We're gonna talk about a couple of FABCAE members during the course of this talk too. I'll shout them out when we get to them. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, plants can eat pee if they want to. Don't tell plants what to do. You're not their boss. <laughs> We're all friends. Safety continued. Lots of old painted houses are painted with lead paint. Keep that in mind as you were deciding where to forage. The, there's this cute little town that I grew up in in Massachusetts with a lot of cute wooden painted houses, but I know that those houses have been getting painted since the 1800s, and I know what paint used to be made out of. So I will not be foraging right next to any of those homes because lead is a big tummy no-no. Uh, <laughs> lead, I, I guess I can't call lead the silent killer because we already have something called that, but just something to be mindful of. If it's a brick house that's never been painted and the house is like a hundred or something years old, you're probably in the clear. But just a note about painted houses and lead paint. Also, if you ever want to feel really bad about humankind's footprint on your area, the EPA has an interactive website where you can find all super fun sites and any spills in your area, they report both dangerous spills and not dangerous spills. So before you click on your city and have a little baby heart attack, know a lot of those spills are not things that are gonna be dangerous for you or the environment, but some of them are. I mostly like using this note when people are gathering along rivers, creeks, and streams. It's so smart to check a little ways upstream from where you're gathering. Uh, you simply don't always know what industries are currently or have been upstream from where you are. I know, ooh, super fun sites. Right there. I'm right there with you, Clay. Cute little things like super fun sites. Also, be mindful of areas beside roads and railroads. Now, I'm not talking about your small cul-de-sac road running into your neighborhood. I'm talking about things like highways. I'm talking about things with more than two lanes where car traffic is heavy and thus things like runoff and exhaust and oil and fuel leakage are 
they have a higher probability of being a problem. Also, harvesting beside railroads, if the railroad is active, I can guarantee you that once a year they are coming through and they are spraying that vegetation on either side to keep it from growing onto the railroad tracks. We have a ton of beautiful staghorn sumacs growing along the railroad that runs right by my house and I can't touch them. And yes, it makes me sad, but I would much rather be healthy in the long run than have some gently polluted staghorn sumac in the short run. And thus concludes our safety notes. Who is excited to learn about some plants? I am. Well, I already know about them, but I'm excited to talk to you about some plants. That's me kissing an elm tree in my backyard. <laughs> oh, you guys are the best. Look at all of that excitement. <laughs> Yes, my sweet baby elm trees. We have two in our backyard. There we go. So first things first, let's talk about the Eastern red bud. I wanted to talk about it first because in areas further south of us, your time to consume the flowers is like, that's a window that's quickly closing. Red buds are in the Fabaceae family. Thank you, Kat, you got to it before. I did, very nice. We love a nitrogen fixing tree and we love a Fabaceae member that is not dangerous to our sweet internal organs. Now, this is the time of year when it is the easiest to recognize a red bud because of their red buds. The English language is not creative in how we name plants. That even leads to some confusion that we will talk about later. So Eastern red buds, what are the edible bits? The ones they're most famous for, of course, are those beautiful magenta flowers. I find that they taste more like a true Fabaceae member. They taste more like sugar snap peas when they are closed. They taste sweeter and more lemonade-y once they are open. So if you wanted to say make something like red bud capers, like Brenna just shouted out in the chat, I would gather them while they're still closed and still are a bit more vegetal. But if you were making something like red bud jelly, like Lexi called out, I would wait until they're open. But that's just me. The leaves, also edible. If you get them while they are still immature, and the great way to tell that the leaves are immature, they will still have a shine to them. They will still have a slight reddish hue to them, especially around the outer edge of the leaf. That's something that a lot of our trees do as kind of a protection against frost while they're still opening up. If there is a danger of frost when the leaf traditionally opens, which for red buds, very much true in the Northern parts of their range. While the leaves are young, they're really tender and you can just eat them as salad greens. Once they get a bit older and a bit tougher, I'm not saying you can't eat them like salad greens. Go to town, get that fiber. Don't let me tell you what to do. But I think that a little bit of processing, pickling them to use them as like a dolma wrap or something of that general nature really just makes them chef's kiss. Mwah. Yes, leaf chips, light grape leaves. And yes, Temperance, this is going to be recorded and it will be posted on YouTube later. So. If you're like, oh my God, she's saying too many words too fast. One, story of my entire life. I've been getting that note pretty much since I started talking and I'm very sorry about it. <laughs> and yes, you will get to watch this back later. <laughs> also, the immature seed pods, while they're still green, before they get brown and hard, are super tasty. I liken them to like green beans meets sugar snap peas. They are super delicious. They also pickle very well. I will pickle daylily buds and red bud seed pods at the same time because for us, they are in season at the same time. And I believe they are in the mid-Atlantic area too, which is a couple of weeks before us here in Ohio. And they pickle really well. Our Western red buds are equally edible. I was just munching on a bunch of them while I was in Vancouver last week. Also very nice and tart. Everything that counts for Eastern red bud also counts for Western red bud. And that is an excellent question. So thank you so much. 
<laughs> okay, and sorry for my sniffles. Um, I'm getting a roundhouse kicked by my allergies this year. It's probably because I spend so much time outside and all of the trees are literally just yeeting pollen currently. It's a real, like I get why they have to, but it's a real problem for my nose. Oh, someone said daylily bugs pickled, really? Yes, they're delicious and a little bit spicy. And now you're making me sad that I didn't put daylilies into this presentation. Dang nabbit. Dead nettle does help a ton with allergies. I put dead nettle in my soup a couple nights ago and I probably should have had some yesterday. On to the next one. Elms. You saw me kissing the elm tree in my backyard. This is another one that's a little bit time sensitive. I don't know why I felt putting the time sensitive ones at the beginning of the presentation was going to make a huge difference. Like someone's gonna close their laptop and leave their home to go and gather these before they miss it. <laughs> but elms, specifically the Samaras on elms are a delicious treat. My backyard trees are full of them right now and they are delicious while they are still completely green. I trying to think what veggie I liken them to the most. They're just very pleasant and slightly sweet and a little proteiny from the developing seed on the inside while they're still completely green. Once they start changing colors, I would just wait for them to completely change to brown. And you can, if you're more patient than me, mm, take the seed chaff off of those little seeds at the center and use them in a lentil-like capacity but once again, I am lazy, so I just eat them while they're green. <laughs> One of these eternities, I'm going to take the time to like eat them for their proteiny, fully developedness, but now is not that time. <laughs> yes, a spring green, a spring, mm, a green spring snack and a brown fall snack. But speaking of things that are edible in fall, so we have a couple different kinds of elms that you will find planted throughout North America. We of course have our native elms, which are going through quite the plight right now on the Eastern side of the United States, uh, what with Dutch elm disease. On the Western side of the United States, the elms that have been transplanted there, fingers crossed, knock on wood, seem to be doing well. It really seems like the disease has not fully made its way completely across the United States yet, which is rad. Um, but we also have a ton of Siberian elms. My elms in the backyard are Siberian elms, um, which also produce Samaras. American and Siberian elms make their Samaras in the spring. Chinese elms, which we also love having as ornamentals, make their Samaras in the fall. So that is a great way to tell which group of them you're looking at. And it means if you find a Chinese elm, you get Samaras in the fall too. Ba, 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 ba. On to the next one. I'm sorry, that one only had one edible bit. I always feel bad when that's the case, but those are the rules. Okay, so we talked about unsung heroes. It's time to talk about an unsung villain, which is Japanese knotweed and giant knotweed, if you are unlucky enough to live in an area that has both, uh, which on the East Coast is a non-zero amount of people. So I even have some right here to show with me, if you can see me in the tiny screen underneath. Here they are with their canes and their red joints. Very easy to recognize. Uh, Good thing that even though they are one of the most noxious weeds in the United States, they are also extremely edible. I did have to explain to someone last week that noxious weeds as a phrase does not mean that the weed is poisonous. It means that the weed is extremely good at spreading. So when you hear someone use the phrase noxious weed, that is what they are referring to. And yes, you can eat them, please eat them. They are edible raw. When they are raw, they are very much like an apple skin meets rhubarb with a little bit of earthiness. Oh, Alyssa, you said knotweed is the first thing you learn to identify. Oh, when you lived with your cousins in Eastern MA, there is so much knotweed in Eastern Massachusetts right now. That is where my mom's family is from and it's bad and it's coming up there already. 
So let's talk about what you can eat. This is the time of year to be harvesting the spring shoots. And I'm specifying spring shoots. And here's why. When you gather shoots in the spring, what it's extremely like lengthy, deep reaching root system is going to do is use up a little bit more of its energy stores to try and replace those shoots. Japanese knotweed wants to do one thing and it is flower so it can set seed. So in the springtime, if you are gathering shoots, they are going to waste a lot of energy trying to replace them, which is great. I honestly think that eating should be a bigger part of the control method for Japanese knotweed. I don't know who does the marketing for ramps, but I need them to do the marketing for knotweed because how much better for the planet would it be if we were eating it instead of like trying to pump them full of herbicides every year, many of which knotweed is resistant to. So the reason why you gather shoots in the spring and not in the fall is, like I said, in the spring, break off a shoot, the root's like, oh no, I gotta replace it. Uses up a little bit of its energy stores, puts up a new shoot. If you break off shoots in the fall, the root's gonna be like, hey man, I already did my job. I don't need to put out any, any more shoots. And instead it will dedicate energy to expanding its root system. So if they've already flowered, y'all just leave the canes until they dry and die. <laughs> don't, don't cut them, don't do it, but eat them all now so they don't even get to that point. Yeah, so not weed, please eat it. If, it, if you do end up finding knotweed that has gone to flower. Is that very depressing? Absolutely. But the flowers are beautiful. They're very aromatic. A lot of our pollinators, native and non-native, love them. So at least it's doing a solid for them. I see both native bees and honeybees that would visit the Japanese knotweed in our old neighborhood during the summertime if it made it to flower. And you can put the entire little like flower clumps, the entire flower heads into say sugary lemon water if you want to make a fermented cordial. Or if you don't wanna let it sit and ferment, you can just let the flowers sit in it for a night or two, seep the flavor in and then drink it before it gets bubbly. In Japan, knotweed honey is highly sought after. It is usually much more expensive than other kinds of honey. But that is an area where Japanese knotweed also has like natural predators to keep it under control, which it does not have here, except for us, chomp, chomp. Also, everyone in here who's like suggesting all of these baked goods, yes. If you have a recipe that uses rhubarb, you can replace it with knotweed, I promise. And unlike rhubarb, I feel like knotweed lends itself equally well to sweet and savory dishes. I made, I've been like cranking through flatbreads this week because I'm recipe testing them for my book. And I made a Japanese knotweed dip to go with them. I just cooked the Japanese knotweed in canola oil until they got soft, added a little bit of salt, added a little bit of garlic powder, mixed it all up together until it became a smooth spread and dipped my bread into them. And it's delicious. It is so good and it is so easy. So please eat Japanese knotweed. And when you are eating your Japanese knotweed while you are walking home with your handful full of earth helpedness, don't drop them. Don't drop it. Don't drop that dun dun dun. Don't do it because all it takes, I'm gonna pull out a shoot for this. All it takes is one of these hitting the ground and it will set a new set of roots. Don't drop pieces of Japanese knotweed. Key identifiers, what a wonderful question. You're gonna have a hollow stem. I'm just gonna hold one up to my camera. You're gonna have a hollow stem. It will make a very satisfying pop when you pop it off of the main plant. It is going to have these characteristic red speckles on its green body, and it's going to be jointed. Thank you so much, Grace. It's going to be jointed, and the joints are always going to be reddish. Here you go, this is like, a pretty young Japanese knotweed shoot, they can grow a lot in a day. It's also gonna be characterized while it is still pretty young. I'm gonna find one that my cat has not 
tried to bite. Um, it'll have these nice, almost arrow shaped leaves that unfurl as it grows. So here we go. The older it gets, the more it'll start doing what this one has started doing, which is going at an angle after each joint, which is very much a buckwheat family thing to do. And these guys are in the buckwheat family. So I've also heard it, heard it called tiger cane. Um, I have heard some people call it bamboo, but even though it looks extraordinarily similar to bamboo, they are not related. So there we go. I'm glad I knew that I wanted to have some nearby for this talk. Um, I also feel like this is one of those plants that once you see it, you're going to start seeing it in a lot of places. So for that, I am very sorry. But yes, Japanese knotweed. You can tell this shoot is a little older than the rest because it's starting to go at increasingly like smaller angles the further up it grows. Oh, thanks for my jar compliment. They're all just canning jars because I'm constantly like canning and bottling things. <laughs> Okie dokie. So that was Japanese knotweed. Next we have magnolias. And yes, our pink and white saucer magnolias get a lot of the hype because they're one of the first ones to bloom in the spring. But I'm very much here for our native magnolias too. Right here, I have a picture of our Southern magnolia, magnolia grandifolia. Also, we have sweet bay magnolia, which I believe is magnolia virginiana. And those guys, also edible. The flowers are what they are most famous for in terms of eating. The flowers range a lot between different species and between different hybrids, but all of them tend to have a note of gingeriness, a note of floral, a note of citrus, and a note of bitter. And they all kind of just fall somewhere on that matrix. So I always suggest taking a little nibble, if you find a tree with a lot of flowers, taking a little nibble of one petal and seeing what it is you're working with before you like say bring a ton home and realize, oh, this is actually not well suited to the recipe I wanted to use it for. Oh, could you brulee a magnolia? Uh, I don't see why not. I don't see why not. I just made a nochino creme brulee a couple of weeks ago, which don't ask me how I made a vegan creme brulee. It took a lot of time. It was a multi-day process. <laughs> One of these days when I have the energy to make it again, I'll make a video about it. I just wanted to see if it worked and it did. <laughs> so flowers, delicious. I've been seeing pickled magnolia blossoms finding their way into the food zeitgeist. Last spring, I saw a couple big name chefs pickling magnolia petals for their social media pages, which makes my heart very happy. Now the leaves, this one is, this one was newer to me. Going into last year, I knew that sweet bay magnolia leaves could be used in place of bay leaves, both in like cooking and in terms of making sweet bay magnolia tea from the leaves, which I love. But last year, I went to a restaurant called Kajitsu in Japan, which makes a lot of Japanese temple food. And I found out there's a dish called hoba miso in which a soaked magnolia leaf has miso and different veggies, or if you eat meat, also meat, put directly onto the magnolia leaf. And then that leaf is placed directly into hot coals. So the aromatics from the leaves kind of permeate into everything that you're cooking along with that miso. And so of course I had to dig into that more. And I found that magnolia leaves and magnolia flowers are also used to perfume and flavor rice in lots of areas in Korea, in Japan, and China as well. So isn't that so fun and cool? I wanna try making hoba miso with Southern magnolia this year because their leaves are huge. <laughs> There we go. I know magnolias are so much fun. I love them. One of the first plants I learned how to ID as a kid is that all magnolias that leaves are edible. Yes. So the only thing on magnolias that we're going to want to avoid and not necessarily because it's bad for us, but just because they taste really bad are the fruits. Um, but magnolias, that whole genus, not poisonous. 
I love how a bunch of people at the same time are like, you need to tell us about all of the kinds of magnolia. So this is just the entire magnolia genus. And I love that everyone was on the same page at the same time. <laughs> Up next, we have wood sorrel. It gets an air horn because everyone who knows it gets really excited about it. And I had to give a couple of the different names because so many people grew up eating wood sorrel, but everyone kind of called it different things. I grew up calling them lemon clovers. I know some people grew up calling it sour grass. And the thing that I think is the most magical about wood sorrel is it's very much a plant that children teach other children about. Right? Like for everyone in the comments, it's like, that was one of the first ones I learned how to ID. Didn't you learn it from another kid? Why do we all know? <laughs> and for everyone who's asking how we would tell wood sorrel from clover, uh, clovers are next, spoiler alert. So we're gonna do we're gonna do a little back and forth thing. But the thing that I think is the most helpful is that true clovers are not going to have those heart-shaped leaves. They are not going to have that adorable, like heartbreakingly adorable little divot at the top of their leaves. So when you pluck them, it's just like a singular little heart. I think they're so cute. So wood sorrel is extremely bright lemony and a little bit sweet. Um, I think it makes a really good lemonade dupe. I will say if you are making your lemonade with hot water, the longer it stews in hot water, the more oxalic acid breaks down. So the less lemony it's going to be. So if you have time for a cold infusion, do that instead. I have learned that the hard way. Rhubarb, yes, does also have a lot of oxalic acid. Thank you, Eva, because the thing that I always wanna bring up with wood sorrel, because it's the thing that it gets vilified for the most is the reason why it's tart is oxalic acid. Now, oxalic acid gets vilified a lot. If you have a history of kidney stones, you have probably been told to stay away from it, and you should. If you don't have a history of kidney stones, honestly, you don't really have a lot to worry about. Wood sorrel is not the only plant that has oxalic acid in it. Rhubarb has oxalic acid. Knotweed has oxalic acid. Spinach has oxalic acid. Doc has oxalic acid. A ton of things, both wild and store-bought contain them, but we see wild plants getting vilified a lot more just because they are less familiar to us. So if you are not worried about eating spinach, I would not worry about eating wood sorrel. If you are worried about eating spinach, put that down, hand slap. <laughs> so take a good look at these guys, look at the leaf configurations, look at the cute heart shapes, and look at that little flower head that's starting to emerge in this picture. It's gonna have a cute little five petaled yellow flower. And now we are going to go to true clovers, specifically white and red, because I feel like these are the ones that we see the most often. This was an awful picture for me to choose two weeks ago, me. Okay, at the end of this, I'm gonna bring you guys up a better picture. The flowers are a very good tell, um, but oh my God, why did I not choose like a top down picture where you can see their cute little ovaly leaves with their little Vs that go towards, oh my gosh, we'll fix this. This is another Fabaceae member, both of them, Trifolium repens and Trifolium pretense. These are your true clovers. You will find them mixed in with a lot of ground cover. They probably come up in your lawn or a neighbor's lawn during this time of year. The bees are obsessed with the flowers. The red ones get bigger than the white ones by and large, but the things that are edible are true for both of them. The flowers are probably the most popular. They are like sweet straight off the plant. Sweet and planty. I feel like I always have to remind people that it's not gonna taste like a candy bar straight off, straight out of the ground, but it is going to be sweet and green. Also, because they are a nice little Fabaceae member, those guys tend to hold on to a bit more protein than some of our other plant friends do. So both the flowers and the leaves can be dried and then ground into a nice proteiny, 
uh, gluten-free flour. If you can do gluten, great to mix in to your regular flour. If you can't do gluten, you can do things like a shortbread, things that don't require gluten development with flour made out of these guys. Um, I do just pop the whole flour in my mouth sometimes, but the uh, bit in the center is gonna taste more green than sweet. You can also just pull off the singular tiny flowers off of the flower heads and eat them. Oh my gosh, tell your sister that I am so thankful that she loves me and that I love her too. Oh my goodness. Everyone, tell everyone that I say hi. <laughs> I also love the leaves in the springtime before the stems get particularly tough wonderful for adding into salads. Once they do get a little tougher in the late spring, early summer through fall, just cook them for a little bit. It'll break them down real nice. I added a bunch to a wild soup that I made a couple of nights ago and they were delightful. So that's white and red clover. We're gonna get a better picture at the end of this or I might just take my computer outside and we'll look at one in real time. <laughs> Next, we have our cherry species, which ba -ba -ba, for everyone who is in the DC area, y'all are very passionate about your beautiful cherry trees as you should be because they are gorgeous. But the thing that I get asked a lot is what about ornamental cherries? Yes, <laughs> ornamental cherries, bird cherries, black cherries, choke cherries, all members of the Prunus genus are going to have edible palms, AKA fruits. Palms is just fancy botanist speak for that particular type of fruiting body. <laughs> and one thing that I wanted to mention because it's a recipe that I've learned in the last year since talking about cherries in my original, the OG lecture that I did for the US Botanic Gardens is so in the Great Lakes region of the Midwest, Historically, and still now, a lot of the Ojibwe and the Anishinaabe would dry the entire cherry, pit and all, and grind the whole thing into flour to use for breads and baked goods. And if you ever want to have the best cake of your life, do that. It's hard work, but it is worth it. And those seeds at the center are very proteiny. Also, uh, before we get questions about pits, and cyanide, two, my answer to that is twofold. One, the danger is always in the dose, obviously. It's the reason why, you know, the first time you accidentally eat an apple seed and you're afraid you're gonna die, everyone's like, you're not. <laughs> Cause you're not, and you didn't. It is definitely always about the dosage. The second thing is the compound, which is not cyanide itself. Your digestive tract just breaks it down. And one of the things it breaks it down into is cyanide. That compound gets broken down when the pits have been heated up. So if you are cooking with those pits, if you are cooking with that flour, that is going to get broken down and you are going to be okay. I'm also going to tell you that some ornamental cherries will taste surprisingly wonderful and some ornamental cherries will not. Some ornamental cherries will make you go, ooh, tree, who hurts you? Why are you so mad at me? That's another one that much like the magnolias, take a little nibble of the fruit while you're out in the field before you know what you're taking home. That being said, the angriest choke cherry, the angriest black cherry, I've never found one angry enough that a little bit of sugar and a little bit of time has not tempered that anger. Now, the blooms, which they're blooming here in Ohio. I already know that they are no longer blooming in DC. I am so sorry, I do not control the seasons, but I love salt curing the blossoms. You can also make tea with the blossoms. That's del delicious. I made a milk tea with cherry blossoms last year. Mwah. Chef's kiss, so tasty. Also salt cured cherry blossoms, salt cured Sakura blossoms are very popular uh, rice addition in Japan. Leaves can also be pickled or salt cured and used to wrap things up, kind of like how you would salt cure a, uh, a shiso leaf. That's the first time in my life I think I've said shiso right on the second try. Still didn't get it right on the first. Oh, we don't want you to take the DC blossoms anyway, it's illegal. There you go, there you go. But if you have one in your yard, bada bing, bada boom, 
Now you know some things that you can do. Up next, lilac. Lilacs are just starting to think about opening in my neck of the woods, which means we are probably well into lilac season, a little way south and east of us. But, oh my gosh, yeah, please don't commit crimes for snacks, says both Silly Kitten and me. Uh, especially don't commit crimes and then say my name when you do. Don't do it. This is the opposite of the Destiny's Child song. Do not say my name, say my name. Because I explicitly told you uh, not to do that. Don't do it. It's like when I sign off saying happy snacking, don't die. Don't die. I specifically told you don't die. So don't die. <laughs> so next we have our lilacs. Yes, the one edible part is the flowers. Yes, every single time I can only list one thing for a plant, it makes me feel a little bit like a failure. But lilacs are so versatile. And if you learn these two ways to infuse their flavor into things, the sky is honestly the limit. And it's this, it is either leaving your lilacs overnight in a milk of your choice. I like oat milk because it is naturally a little bit sweet. Uh, if you do moo juice and you have that in your fridge, put the lilacs into that. Also works well with soy milk. Almond milk, while also being kind of bad for the environment, is a little thin. I find that it doesn't hold on to flavor as well as some of the more proteiny or the more fatty non-dairy milks. So if you were choosing a non-dairy milk, it would be oat, soy, coconut, almond in descending order for me. <laughs> And you can also cold or warm infuse them into water. Water infusions are great for like making syrups out of, and those syrups can be drizzled onto cakes, can be used as the base of a frosting. Um, but having them soak in milk is also great for being at the base of cakes, for making things like panna cottas or puddings or ice creams, lilac ice cream. I mean, hello. So just infusing them, I think, really extends their cooking life, in my humble opinion. I made a lilac panna cotta last year, and I'm still thinking about it, and I can't wait to make another one. I cannot wait to make another one. You can heat milk and lilac to extract the flavor, but whenever you're heating things that have a more delicate floral scent, I will remind you, some of those... Uh, sweet little flavonoids that you're smelling are going to go volatile when you heat them. So if you have the time to let them cold infuse overnight, I'd cold infuse. If you don't have the time, go ahead and heat them up. You're still going to get a lot of the flavor. Just be mindful of how long they're exposed to heat. Infused sugar is very easy to do. Uh, you can honestly just blitz lilac and sugar together in a little food processor or in a tiny little blender. Um, you can also just leave lilacs, whole lilacs, in sugar in a container for an extended period of time and let the scent kind of slowly leach into the sugar. Those would be my two ways. But blending them with sugar is real cute because the sugar turns purple. My lilac sugar always goes damp and weird smelling. Yes, you can't leave it for a very long time. Or if it is damp upon blending, what I would do, spread it out on a little sill pat on a baking sheet and dry it in your oven on its lowest setting. Unless your oven's lowest setting isn't under 200 degrees. In that case, dry it in a dehydrator or dry it in your oven on its lowest setting, but with a little wooden spoon propping the oven door open. So there you go. Um, if you are a person who uh, likes honey, you can put lilacs directly into honey, flip it every couple of days because they're going to try and float. Um, from my, my honey days, I remember infusing a lot of honeys with lilacs and having delicious results. So there you guys go. Ooh, sugar cubes. Oh, infused lilac sugar cubes. Can you imagine? Oh, the sassafras lady. Honestly, put the sassafras lady on my tombstone. That's what I want my identifier to be. I was just talking to Grace and Libby, who are keeping things, this show on the road, uh, keeping me from going completely off of the rails about my love of sassafras and how I feel like it was wronged by the FDA. But once again, another talk for another day.
Okay, we're doing unexpected spring foraging. I just spit a little because I got so excited. Tell no one that doesn't leave this chat. <laughs> uh, so we're going to do one of my favorite spring edibles. I have to preface it with a taste of danger for a myriad of reasons. Some of you are gonna know why the second we look at it. For the rest of you, I'm going to explain why immediately after we talk about it. So let's get into it. Meet the American cow parsnip if you have not been introduced to it already. That is the American cow parsnip at full size. I am just shy of six feet tall. They tend to get about as tall as me, maybe even a little bit taller. Yes, the sunburn plant. You already know exactly, exactly what we're talking about. And if you don't want to harvest it, that is so okay. And Eric, we are going to talk about how to know that it is not hemlock in just a second. Now, American cow parsnip has a lot of edible bits, but cow parsnip, like every member of the carrot family, demands diligence. It demands respect and it demands time. Those three things are so necessary to properly IDing any member of the APACAE family, the carrot family. Because of needing those three things, a lot of people will avoid the carrot family altogether. And honestly, that's a vibe. If you don't want to take that time, I respect the heck out of you and I will never tell you that you need to. We just said we were talking about unexpected spring edibles. So I had to show up, show out for my baby, the American cow parsnip. We have to respect the carrot family. For um, Sursa in the comments, so Queen Anne's Lace is a different plant, but it's in the same family. And I know exactly why you asked that question because they have those very recognizable white umbels of flowers as many members of the APAE, APACAE family do. So the edible bits of the cow parsnip. So when it is still a basil rosette hanging out near the ground and the leaves are tender, um, we are in that time frame right now in the lower Midwest, but we will be exiting it very soon. Those leaves are super nice and tender. They are amazing for eating as a wilted salad or for drying to turn into a mild spice that's very reminiscent of celery seasoning. Um, celery seasoning with a bit more excitement, uh, in my opinion. Now the mature leaves get even more aromatic than the tender baby leaves at the beginning of the season that overwinter. They also can become huge. I'm talking like bigger than your head, huge. They kind of look like humongous maple leaves with a little extra flair at the bottom. Those guys are greater, those guys are great for making a stronger spice when dried or for like wilting or pickling to make an aromatic wrap for say rice. The unopened flower buds are like a bit of a delicacy, but I'm going to tell you if you find a patch, maybe only take one. American cow parsnip has been kind of fighting for its life in the comments these last few years because so many people conflate it with both poison hemlock and its older, meaner sister, giant hogweed. Giant hogweed and cow parsnip are in the same genus. Um, they are both technically edible, but giant hogweed, the burns that it can cause are much worse. So I would never suggest uh, approaching it or touching it. You can approach giant hogweed and like marvel at its terrifying 15 foot splendor, but I wouldn't go rubbing up against it. These plants, create those reactions, not for us, but for insects that might try to eat them and kill them. So remember that it will make you take it a little less personally. 
The seeds also of cow parsnip are such an underrated spice. And that is one of the safest things to gather because you can wait for the plant to die back. You can wait for the seed head to go completely brown and look for its adorable heart-shaped seeds. And once the seed head has gone completely brown, any fear of the sap having a reaction with your sweat and the UV from the sun is gone. So we're gonna talk about telling the difference between cow parsnip and two different hemlocks, both water hemlock and poison hemlock, both of which are huge tummy nanos. Also, the stalks are really tasty on cow parsnip, but if you eat the stalk, then you like automatically aren't gonna get any flowers. I feel like that goes without saying. So if you find a huge batch of them and you're careful and you have gloves and you feel like you are a skillful forager, go for it. It's a tasty treat. Uh, if you don't check every single one of those boxes I just said, just marvel, just marvel. So, but why danger? One, we've already mentioned this, folks with sensitive skin, may get a reaction from the sap. It's the sap once a leaf is broken, once a flower head is broken, once a stem is broken. That sap needs UV and sweat to start a reaction, which is why you'll see a lot of people on hikes who accidentally run into a cow parsnip, cut a cow parsnip out of the way on the trail, will get like those burns and those welts because one, they're not like going home to wash it off their skin. And two, they have fulfilled the other two requirements. They're sweaty because they're hiking and the sun is likely beating down on them because they are hiking outside. If you found a way to hike inside, I mean, I guess, tell me about it. That sounds like something that some people would be into, especially during allergy season. Um, I might be one of those people. <laughs> so if you're going to be harvesting it, even if you don't have sensitive skin. I personally have never had a reaction to cow parsnip, but I also, despite not having sensitive skin, always harvest using gloves. I use gloves and a little like plant snipper or the blade side of my hori hori. And it'll always be the last thing that I gather just in case. So it'll be the last thing I get so I can go, put it in its cute little mesh bag, put it into my backpack, go home, wash my hands. Another reason why it is dangerous is because it does have some dangerous lookalikes. Um, it also has a lot of edible lookalikes, but you know, those aren't the things that you're afraid of. We're obviously afraid of the dangerous lookalikes. So let's talk about some of them. Here we have poison hemlock. Uh, if your name is Socrates, this guy is like your worst enemy. Uh, but also if your name is Socrates, you're dead. Number one way to tell the difference is, I don't know how closely you can see the leaves in the close-up of the stem. They are far more lacy, far more delicate than the like maple leaf look of cow parsnip leaves. That is in my opinion, especially while they are still little rosettes on the ground, the easiest way to tell the difference. If you see those lacy, almost fern-like leaves, you do not have cow parsnip, you very likely, especially this time of year, have poison hemlock. Additionally, cow parsnip has a solidly green and fuzzy stem. Poison hemlock, its stem, no hair, it is smooth, it is dusty, and it has purple splotches. So purple splotches, smooth, dusty, that is your poison hemlock. Solidly green, fuzzy, hollow on the inside, smells like celery. That is going to be your cow parsnip. The, like using your nose is also an excellent test. I don't want you to have to get to the point where you're using your nose with poison hemlock, but poison hemlock kind of smells like rat pee, uh, like rat pee and carrots had a baby. It smells so bad. <laughs> the thing that I mostly am like 
guys, don't put that in your face. Is if I if someone put anything that smelled like poison hemlock near my mouth, I would not put it in because it smells awful. It does not smell like something you want to eat. Whereas the smell of cow parsnip makes my mouth water. <laughs> so that is the lookalike that I see getting confused with cow parsnip the most. Um, once again, giant hogweed is a worry, but most places in the United States have not actually had a confirmed giant hogweed sighting. Um, it's one of those things that everyone has been taught to be very afraid of and very wary of, despite the fact that it only exists in a few very select places in North America. But this guy is native and another one to look out for. Once again, I think the white flowers are what really does it for people in terms of the confusion. This is our water hemlock. It is native to the United States. It also enjoys keeping its feet wet just like cow parsnip does. So you will sometimes find them in comparable landscapes, along creeks, along slow moving rivers. That being said, leaves on water hemlock, way smaller, way smaller, very lacy, like the leaves on poison hemlock, but even smaller than the leaves on poison hemlock. Also, like I said, cow parsnips can get up to six feet tall. Water hemlock is gonna stay a lot shorter. I usually see them top out around three feet. So also you're gonna see all of that branching with different flowers coming out of different singular, like separated branches from that stem. Cow parsnips, they're just gonna have that one main stem and all of the flowers are gonna come out of it. So if you're looking at plant structure, that is another great way to know that it is cow parsnip versus water or poison hemlock, which both grow in very similar configurations. Yes, I would recommend going with an expert or someone who just knows the carrot family better than you do um, before ever eating any of them. It took me years before I felt comfortable like bringing Queen Anne's lace home to eat, bringing cow parsnip home to eat. I still don't eat water parsnips because I don't think I have a good enough eye yet to tell the difference between water parsnip and, <laughs> and oh my gosh, water parsnip and water hemlock. Those two get conflated all the time and look way more like each other than the three we just talked about. So there we go. Cow parsnips are also native across the US. And I feel like a lot of people are like, but why do we want to eat it? Like, it's very dangerous. I, I would lovingly like to say um, that thousands of years of ethnobotanical evidence of tons of indigenous tribes enjoying cow parsnips as food can't be wrong. <laughs> Uh, that's just my little loving reminder that <laughs> we can't discount native science. <laughs> there we go. So that's been Danger Snacks. Now let's talk about some books. If you are wanting to continue your foraging obsession. Right now, these are all of Samuel Thayer's books. They have been my favorites for years. And in terms of a balance of knowledge, of excellent, clear pictures, and of humor, I feel like it's very hard to beat Sam's books when you are learning the field. So here are his three, Forager's Harvest, Nature's Garden, and Incredible Wild Edibles. I will spell Sam Fair, Samuel. I can't spell today. Samuel Fair, there it's his name in the chat. And his books are great. And his sense of humor, also fantastic. Uh, I was terrified of meeting him for the longest time because I was like, there's no way that uh, this esteemed member of the community is going to love a goober like me. And then I found out he's just a goober too, who like climbs a tree, who climbs trees like a squirrel and is just excited to talk to other people about plants. So if you ever get the chance to meet Sam Thayer, I would do it. Ooh, Russ, yes, shout out Sweet Sicily and Fennel. 
Fennel is a noxious weed in the California region. So if you live in that area, eat your fennels. Also, Sweet Sicily is delightful. We have two different kinds here in the Midwest, and you will know them because they smell like old-timey licorice when you break them. You have Forager's Harvest arriving today. Yay, Heather! Oh, that makes me so happy. <laughs> so this is great if you are just getting started with foraging and you just want to lay a really strong foundation. But say you own these books already and you've been at it for like a year or more and you want to take your foraging to the next level. These are the regional foraging series books. I love these because they cover more, Sam really goes in deep with each species, which of course inherently means you cover fewer species in the book. The regional foraging series, which we have leans into the computer like an old person, Pacific Northwest foraging, Southeast foraging, Southwest foraging, Midwest foraging, Mountain States foraging, Northeast foraging, California foraging. Why does California get its own book? Beats me. Beats me. There are a lot of microclimes and macroclimes in California. And I feel like if you're going to get that specific, you might as well just dive all the way in and get hyper specific. Um, because people in Northern California are not eating the same thing as the people in Southern California. So for Maryland, I would highly suggest both Southeast foraging and Midwest foraging because you guys are very much at the confluence of those two zones. Um, and the Midwest foraging technically, I think, is supposed to extend as far east as Pennsylvania. But Pennsylvania goes very far east in that it goes all the way to the coast. <laughs> For NYC, I would suggest Northeast foraging, but know that Midwest foraging would also be extremely helpful. Um, Midwest, we really just have a little bit of everything here. <laughs> so I highly recommend that one too. For Georgia, oh, you are solidly Southeast foraging. Um, I'm also jealous of everyone who is in like the true, true South and Southeast because y'all have more than one type of native persimmon and that's unfair. I want more than one type of native persimmon. Uh, you guys also have a lot of the different pawpaw variations, which not fair. We have one Asamina species here and in Georgia and Florida, you guys have multiple like the mouse banana. So enjoy being where you are. <laughs> uh, Texas, you also have different types of persimmons. You literally have your own persimmon species, Diospiros, Texicana, and that is the black American persimmon. So enjoy that, I guess. I'm very jealous, I've never eaten one before. Next, if you're like, I got my IDs down, but I wanna know what amazing foods I can make with them, highly recommend The Forager's Pantry by Ellen Zakos. She's fantastic. If anyone's going to the Midwest Foragers Gathering this year, she's leading classes, she's giving talks. I am obsessed with her. This is her newest book and the recipes are phenomenal. So the Forager's Pantry, she also much like me, loves cow parsnip and refuses to let it be ignored, but also gives like all of the same safety notes that I gave about it. Yeah, Plantarama Ellen Zakos, yes. I love her podcast so much and I never meet anyone else who also listens to it. Yo, I need to put together a bookshop.org list. That is such a good idea, Eva. I'm gonna do that. Are you going looking for morels after this talk, Joe? So am I, so am I. It's morel season, it's happening, we're doing it. So if you already say have Forager's Pantry or if you're out here trying to feel a bit gourmet, if you're trying to get your gourmand on, this is Alan Burgo's first book, Flora. He is a classically trained chef of almost two decades. This book, I learn something new every single time I open it. Um, even if you are not following the recipes exactly, he has so many tips and tricks for beautiful ways to treat your foraged finds. I, mm, I love it so much. Do you ever see someone write something and you're mad about how good it is? That is how I feel about Alan Burgos' Flora. That is how I feel about Alan Burgos' Flora. So would highly recommend this book as well. And that brings us to the end of our presentation, you guys. Woohoo! 
Thank you so much, Alexis. Can we keep you for 10 minutes for oh, some Q&A? Of course. And I, I sat here and I was like, I did fewer plants this time. It's definitely not going to take me the full hour to go through them. False. False. There's just too much fabulous information. <laughs> too many excellent questions. Oh, I know. We've got some awesome folks who have joined us today. Um, I'll just dive right in. We have a question from um, a nine-year-old. He recently had a tooth removed, and he's wondering if there's something that he can forage to help. Um, he's interested in gum health and healing, and they live in Baltimore, Maryland. Oh my gosh, that's wonderful. So nettles are really good for inflammation. So stinging nettle or wood nettle, if you can find it, I would highly suggest. Be careful when you're harvesting it. Definitely use gloves. The stings aren't awful, but they're definitely not fun. Also, if you are lucky enough to be in an area where a spilanthes, a buzz button plant has maybe gone feral, or if you even wanna grow them yourself, spilanthes are literally called the toothache plant. Um, and they feel kind of like an electric buzz and then your mouth kind of goes a little bit numb. Historically, they have been chewed to help with things like toothaches. And also they're just kind of a really fun party trick to give to your friends and watch them go, whoa, what's that? So that's an excellent question. And those would be my recommendations. Awesome, thank you. Um, our next question is black haw and viburnum are in season right now. And are any of the flowers in the viburnum family edible? Ooh, so I believe the black haw and any of the like high bush cranberry viburnum fam members would have edible flowers. But that is one of the cases where I'm just like, I personally would rather have the fruits in the fall than something flavored with the flowers. I think the fruits trump them enough that I wouldn't want to lose any of them, but that is just me. But you will like not get hurt eating the flowers or flavoring something with the flowers if you're just in love with the scent. Excellent to know. Um, how do we eat or take only enough for us and not too much from the plants that we are foraging? Oh, that's such a good question. Definitely good to one, assess both the plant you are gathering and the area you're gathering from. So say for example, you're gathering Japanese knotweed, I would say gather that, like don't, don't worry. Like don't worry about gathering not weed or any of your invasives because one, a lot of them are invasives because they are so good at spreading prolifically. There will be more left for other people to gather. But if you say are gathering a native species, honestly, take a minute to assess the area and see how many other members of that species you see around you. Um, it's kind of like what I mentioned during cow parsnips a lot of the patches of them here in Ohio are smaller because people are mistaking them for hemlocks or mistaking them for their, you know, me and older sister giant hogweed and are taking them out. So when I see them, I don't like to necessarily harvest whole flowers. I like to make sure that they can go to seed, that they can live out their entire lifespan. Maybe take one leaf from a plant um, and then come back at the end of the season and leave some seeds to fall on the ground and take some seeds home with me. A lot of it is just using common sense and asking yourself, if 10 more people follow behind me for the next couple of weeks that this is in season and do the exact same thing I'm doing, what do I think is going to happen to this plant population? Um, I know we all know about ramps. That's one that I very much like to Tell people, just think about it because you're not the only one who's going to see them. Other people are going to see them. What if they do the exact same thing that you do? Um, and ramps, for us here in Ohio, I was jokingly telling Grace before this talk, I think we live at the perfect distance of too far away from New York and too far away from Chicago. So people don't really come here for ours. Um, so you'll see Ohio foragers getting what some would call flippant with their ramp usage um, because they're seeing that ramp gathering without context. You're seeing what would be extremely irresponsible for someone in say the state of New York, someone in say the state of New Jersey, the state of Illinois. So, so much of it has to do with context and knowing the area that you are gathering from well. 
Thanks, Alexis. And for our DC crowd, have you ever foraged in DC? And are there places around DC that you like to forage or maybe plants you look for? I was just in DC a month ago and I ate a handful of elm samaras off of every elm tree I walked under. <laughs> I was just like, oh, mm, trail snack. Um, and they pop. Um, and those are just hanging out all around the city. <laughs> But I haven't done a ton of like leaving the city proper foraging in green spaces. I would be open to other people's suggestions of places to go and forage legally. Legally. <laughs> no breaking the rules and especially no breaking the rules and then saying my name. And in connection with that, I know we've chatted about this in some of our other talks, but is there, what's the the quick way to find out if where you're foraging is a legal place to forage. Okay, so there are, are different answers for different spaces. If you are, say, in a state park, your state should, I say should because not every state stays up to date on these things, but should have a list of the things that you can and can't forage, if foraging is allowed at all in your state parks. Here in Ohio, for example, berries on the table, mushrooms on the table, but there are also plants you need permits for, like wild ginger, like ginseng, um, like golden seal. So it's all about doing a little bit of research. Um, I'm sure that some other foragers will tell you, definitely not me, definitely things I heard from other foragers that sometimes City parks won't have any rules about foraging posting, and then it's kind of up to your discretion. Uh, I make a lot of friends, a lot of rangers, and a lot of city parks. And uh, just use your words, make some friends, uh, especially if what you're gathering is non-native or invasive. Sometimes even when it's against the rules on the park, they'll be like, oh, you want some garlic mustard? Wonderful. I'm going to show you where a huge freaking patch of it is because if you don't take it now, I'm going to have to dig it up in a week anyway before it sets seed. So I know in this era of how isolated we are, and I hate doing it too, uh, you just have to you just have to talk to people sometimes. Uh, sometimes you can just make a phone call if it's a national park. Um, see what's on the website first. Of course, I'm not a mad woman. But if you can't find the information you need on the website, sometimes a phone call or talking face to face is excellent. Perfect. And to cap us off today, can you tell us about your upcoming book or any upcoming projects you're working on? And while you do that, we'll put your social media stuff in the chat. So if anybody's not already following you, we'll make sure they can uh, find a way to you. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. I, I am currently writing a book. It is it is half field guide, half cookbook, because growing up, I always wanted a book that was both, and I was never able to find any that I felt did both sides of that justice. Some books are like blah at the field guide part, and then the recipes are amazing, or vice versa. So I'm trying very hard to do both well. Speaking of which, I got to go and take some pictures of some plants later. Uh, <laughs> it should be out late next year. Publishing takes a long time. I did not know that until I was in the thick of it. Publishing takes a long time. It feels like it's very far away, but can vouch. Uh, I feel like I blinked and fast forwarded from me signing my book deal at the end of last year to it suddenly being the end of April. So time, time will fly. Um, I will keep teasing recipes from it, um, probably much to my publisher's chagrin. <laughs> I definitely just gave away my dandelion fritter recipe like from the book on my TikTok a couple of days ago. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not gonna do it for everything, but like people wanna know how to make it and dandelions are in season right now, so. <laughs> I have not decided the name of my book yet. I feel like I have to call it Happy Snacking Don't Die though, right? Like it feels like at least the first one that has to be it. So we'll see. 
My mom hates that name. It's also the name of my like one person LLC. She's like, it's gonna make people feel like this is dangerous. And I'm like, mom, it is dangerous. <laughs> we have to take what we have to take foraging seriously. <laughs> yes, exactly. Happy snacking. Parentheses. <laughs> oh, I love that. I know that we are all excited for that book. So I just want to thank you so much, Alexis, for your presentation today and thank everyone for attending.